Okay, welcome to Living Web Farms. Thank you for coming out on this steamy summer evening. Um, we should actually get to see a fair amount of good live bug activity. Um, we certainly can show you a lot of good examples of farmscaping. Um, for those of you that have never been here before, Living Web Farm is a nonprofit that's dedicated to providing us with pathways to the future. We grow food and we test all kinds of different um, new and relatively cutting edge systems for growing food and for building fertility. Um, and the food that we grow, we donate to the hungry. We also have all kinds of workshops. Tonight, we're going to talk about farmscaping. We realized we've had this, we've got two videos up on this. Do we need to talk about it more? Yeah, because there's always people who are ready to learn. This is the moment you're going to get it. And we have the examples all the time because it's an ongoing process. So we do it all the time and it changes. We have usually near amazing success and then we have moments of being like you're still not in charge you know <laughs> and that example at this year was um and last year too for the first time in probably 15 years of my growing i'm being hammered by cucumber beetles it used to be the cucumber beetles were such a trial that i made concrete um reinforcing wire towels towers and covered them with a very lightweight rope cover to keep my cucumbers from being wilted by all the diseases that the cucumber be beetles could vector in. And then the problem went away. I didn't know why. Mark Schoenbeck suggested, and I think he was probably right, that what happened was I had such high levels of Pennsylvania soldier beetles and C-Mac ladybug that they were eating the eggs of the cucumber beetle and that solved the problem. Um, the cucumber beetle's life cycle as a larva is in the soil. It's also known as a corn rootworm. And so in the soil, it doesn't have much of a problem with cold weather. The Pennsylvania soldier beetle and the CMAC ladybug both can be hit really hard by cold weather. And what have we had the last two winters but really hard cold weather? So those, both of those insects, wonderful egg predators, wonderful controls, which we'll either get to see in the garden or I'll show you on a slide up there, right, came in very late. And so from having no problem, I mean, just like maybe, I don't know, 50 cucumber beetles in a greenhouse full of squash and cucumbers, you know, definitely a very manageable number. No big deal. I'd still squish them if I caught one, but I didn't really worry about them. This year, Kate, I'd say, you saw it, right? Clouds, right? Little clouds. You'd walk up and they just fly away like, you know, like fruit flies on a rotting piece of fruit, you know? Just massive numbers. And um, that happens, you know? For us, it was pretty interesting, and we're going to benefit from it tonight because we eventually got a grip on those guys by spraying them with neem, which can go systemic and makes basically, you know, if you drench the soil with it, make it so that the cucumber beetle, doesn't, beetle does not want to feed on the plant. The plant's too bitter for it. It's an antifeedant. And also surround, which acts as an irritant and makes it that no insect wants to be on that plant because it blocks their sphericals and they can't breathe very well. It's a super fine kaolinite clay. Not at all toxic. I mean, both of these plants are things that humans can do very well with, but they help to control the insects. So we got control, but not before we'd hurt these plants so bad but they had a major bloom of aphids. And I mean, really, it looked like the cucumbers were a loss, you know? And then because of good fertility, which is your number one defense for everything, right? As an organic grower, the number one thing is get your fertility up there. Make sure just like for humans, how do you stay healthy? You eat right, you know? Well, you want your plants to be fed right from the soil. Those plants grew out of it. And what were pathetic looking sections of cucumber started having really good growth on top. And since we have them on, um, little pulleys that we can lower them. We could just lower the bad part and bury it. And then we have a perfectly good cucumber again. Um, and so we'll look at that. The upside was that this bloom of aphids that came in on these weakened plants brought in just about every predator you've ever seen. So we should get to see a bunch of predators in there and we'll talk about that. Before we do that though, because that's the fun part, right? The fun part's going and spotting the bugs and maybe we'll see somebody. I mean, literally I got a picture. I was trying to get a picture of a ladybug out there on the goldenrod, and I'll tell you that story in a minute why I always look at goldenrod for predators. But it's the kind of thing where like, you know, kind of hard to get in there. Oh, I'll just take my phone and point it and, and snap, you know, say capture and point it about. The great thing about those phones is you can be a bad photographer and just take a bunch of shots. You get one good one, so all you need, right? One of those shots actually showed not just that ladybug, but a lacewing larva with an aphid by its head, you know? And that's the level of predation you can have if the food is there. So that's one of the principles. So I think what we'll do is very quickly go over these principles. And you know, why don't we sit down for that? We'll sit down for a few minutes. I'll go over the principles, and then we'll go out and look at the examples of them, OK?
I've given this talk and versions of this talk probably 50 times by now, many, many times at the Organic Grower School. And Linda um, Blue, um, past ex now retired extension agent, um, decided to title it The Good, the Bad, and the Bugly. Um, and so over the years of giving it, I realized that the concept wasn't right. And I started off the talk by saying there is no good and there is no bad. If you don't have the supposed bad, you don't have the good, right? What we want is balance through a riot of diversity, right? You do want, actually, the bad bugs. Without the bad bugs, the good bugs aren't there to eat them. And then what happens? Did anybody go to school far enough back to learn about the hares and the lynx? You must have learned that, didn't you? It was a, it was a bio, basic lesson in biology. They just gave the example of, you know, you have this cycle in the, in the northern forest of in the years when there are tons of lynx, there aren't many hares, and then the lynx all starve, and then the hares boom, you know, and then the lynx thrive, and then they eat all the hares, and then there are no lynx. And this is a standard thing. It happens everywhere in nature, right? There's this constant ebb and flow of herbivores and predators. And we want to create enough balance that that is not too big a swing, you know? If we come in and nuke plants because we see a, a bad bug, right, and we hit them with something, let's say, like pyganic, which is pretty non-selective, kills everything, then what we do is we create a situation where there's no herbivores. There's no herbivores. What happens? All the predators crash, right, or they move on, right? Then you have this situation where there's nothing there. And what builds up first? The herbivores. And you get these big outbreaks of pests. You know, so we want to avoid that. We want balance through a riot of diversity. When I say a riot of diversity, if you just turn around and look out at that garden, you'll see that there's all kinds of things flowering. And that's what we want. We want a great diversity of plants that are flowering. And lo and behold, over the years, we've learned that not only do we want plants to flower, we want plants that actually exude nectar even when they're not flowering. They have extra floral nectaries. Okay? So that even if we don't have something flower, we still have nectar out there all the time. But we also want pollen. You know? and we even also want plants that attract large numbers of aphids. And my entomologist friend, Dr. Rich McDonald, who I've given this talk with a whole lot, says, Pat, you know, you're playing with fire there. That's my response. Humans have been playing with fire for a long, long time. You know, you just have to understand what you're doing. What I really want those aphids to be is on plants that have nothing to do with my vegetables because aphids are very specific. So there's an aphid called the goldenrod aphid. I told you I'd tell you about that. It just ended probably about a week ago. But from late May till about middle of June here, it depends where you live, and CeeLo, it was a little bit later, right? It, goldenrod gets covered up with these big, fat, red aphids. They're really gorgeous, and there's lots of them. Anybody ever notice the goldenrod hurting? <laughs> Doesn't seem much matter for the goldenrod, right? But what it is, is a steakhouse for every beneficial insect in the world. Anything it likes to eat, soft-bodied insects, is they are feeding on that goldenrod. So I get tons of great pictures by just looking at the goldenrod. This year, one, I'm trying to get a ladybug and I get a, a lacewing larva eating a red aphid, you know. Um, loads of good pictures. And one year I had uh, an intern who stopped me in a field because I teach everybody this because I'm pretty passionate about sharing information. And so then everybody's looking at the goldenrod. You know, we should be doing something else, but we're all looking at the goldenrod. Wow, look at that, you know. And he's like, Pat, what's this bumblebee doing on the goldenrod? And I'm like, that's not a bumblebee, that's a robber fly. Anybody know what a robber fly is? They're about this big. They're a scary looking fly. They're the T-Rex of flies. Oh. And they're an apex predator. They're, you'll see them try and grab a bean beetle or a Japanese beetle. I mean, that's the level they want to eat at, right? But, and they're never going to bother with an, an aphid. It's just not enough food, you know? But corn on the cob? Yeah, sure. You know, if there's a stalk full of aphids, they'll just sit there and eat and eat and eat. And so everything in the world will feed on these blooms of aphids. The ones that I see all the time that we're glad to have don't cause us any problem um, include things like Milkweed. Milkweed not only gets its own specific aphid, but also has something called the milkweed seed bug. And it's another, as an adult, not a very appealing food. Indeed, it's brightly colored and probably poisonous, and so nobody much will eat it. But as a young, first instar, you know, tiny little bug, very good eating, soft bodied, and so lots of things will feed on it. And so that comes a little later. Earlier in the season, it gets covered up with this really nice, kind of golden color aphid, and it's very specific to milkweed, doesn't get on anything else, and all kinds of things eat it, you know? Likewise, burdock, when it goes to flower, can be covered up with tons of aphids, and these, they don't seem to go much of anywhere else. So you want to actually learn 
when it's fine to not worry about aphids. You know, there can be times, really for us, usually, if you have, if you get the principles I'm going to teach you tonight, aphids should not be a problem anytime except for very early in the season and very late. And that's because very early and very late, the beneficials are at a huge disadvantage. It's cold, there's not much food, they're mostly starting to go to sleep, they'll come out on warm days, but there's not much to eat, they're not thriving. The aphids, on the other hand, have been photographed giving live birth to aphids giving live birth. And if they like their situation, they don't bother with sex. It's parthenogenesis, they just clone, right? They don't waste any time. Their survival tactic, their way to live in the world is massive reproduction. That's all they do. You know, they don't worry about being eaten, they just reproduce at a rate that we can't believe. So if we didn't have predators, we'd be buried under aphids, you know. So literally, in a matter of a couple days, like a warm spell in late fall, you can go from 50 to hundreds of thousands. So that's when they're a problem, because that's when you don't have predators, you know. Uh, otherwise, aphids really should be just a source of food for your beneficials. And they should be out there, but they should never get to be very many, because there's so many things that love to eat them. And the good news is that many of those things that love to eat aphids will also eat the eggs and the early instars of numerous pests, things like the um, Colorado potato beetle, the bean beetle. You know, all of those things are food for this whole array of what mostly feed on aphids, but are happy to feed on any small, soft-bodied source of protein. You know, so that's a piece, and that's why you want a riot of diversity. You want so many different places that you always have aphids, you always have nectar and pollen, you have multiple ways for your beneficials to feed. You know, and the importance of this is really wonderfully illustrated by a story that Dr. Richard McDonald taught, teaches, and I share now, I steal from him, which is you can have two Braconid wasps patch out, right? And one flies off and lands here, and the other one ends up in the Ingalls parking lot. That's a slight exaggeration. They don't fly that far. But just for the sake of, you know, the story, let's assume that's what happens, right? The one that lands in the Ingalls parking lot is going to mate. They always do. It's going to lay eggs. They always do. It lays 30 eggs. When those hatch, what do they do? They fly away looking for food. They're not going to stay at Ingalls, you know? The one that lands here immediately feeds, feeds all it wants, mates, lays 300 eggs. Guess what happens to those eggs? They all hatch out here and they all stay here. So that's why you want that level of food. You get these incredibly increased levels of predation because you have the ideal habitat for the balancing forces to all multiply. You don't worry about the pest. You let the predators take care of the pest, you know? And actually, predators is, a, is really the, kind of the wrong idea. Most of them are parasitoids. They actually lay their eggs in are next to the pest, and the pest is wiped out. And that's, you know, not good for the pest. And it's also not a sustainable thing for the predator if it doesn't have a continuing source of that pest. So you can quickly crash the population if you decide, I'm too afraid of those aphids, I'm going to spray them with soap. You know? And yeah, you'll kill them with soap, they're easy to kill, but you just wiped out the food source for what's going to be controlling many other problems besides those aphids. Okay? So you want to just sit back and say, yeah, I have here, relax, this can be fun, lovely, make your heart sing. Just grow flowers that you love. I've had people get mad at me because I won't give them a formula. Formulas will lead you the wrong way. You really want to grow what you love and what you notice, right? Um, and that is what's a buzz. You want plants that you notice are just buzzing with insects. You don't have to... You know, you don't have to look and count and say, oh, this plant has all good insects. Or this plant has 60% good insects, so I'm going to keep it. You don't care. As long as it's a buzz with insects, you know that you're getting the, the diversity you need, and it'll all work out. You're not in charge. You can't really make it change what it does. Just create the diversity, and you're going to be good. Okay? Nature is your teacher. You are a part of nature. You are your own best teacher. Go out there, pay attention, and you'll learn. You know, literally... When I first started teaching this, I didn't know hardly, any, hardly anything. I called up Richard McDonald. He thought I was crazy. You know, he literally, I called him up. I said, I'm controlling Colorado potato beetle with ladybugs. He thought, another hippie farmer. You know? Then he did his research. In the 30s, that was the only way they could control, control potato beetles. They shipped ladybugs to France to control ladybug, potato beetles. Um, there wasn't any other control. Then we got insecticides. They all forgot that ladybugs. And why he thought I was crazy is no ladybug is going to go up to a potato beetle and kill it. I mean, we all know how big a, probably know how big a potato beetle is, right? And how big a lady beetle is, and it's just not going to happen, right? It doesn't. It doesn't touch the adults. It eats their eggs, 
and it eats their, their young babies, the first couple instars, when they're tiny and soft and delicious, you know. And so just through observation, I figured that out. It's a fun story, but we don't have time for it tonight. Basically, start by putting plants in that you like, you know, and pay attention how they do, and always be open to a new plant, you know. Try it, see what it does. I knew that Virginia Tech was going to be a place that was actually going to do good science and prove that this worked when many other schools had tried to make farmscaping work and said they couldn't make it work because the other schools all tried to use formulas. And I, because Richard McDonald, that was his alma mater, he, alma mater, he got me to stop up there on a trip and visit with those folks. Brinkley Benson was the graduate student doing it then. And we were out looking at all the plants and one of the plants they had in the ground was stevia. And I said, why do you have stevia? And I never heard of stevia as a farmscaping plant. He said, oh, my son loves it. It's like, you're gonna make this work. Because you're not in a box. You're not, you're not looking at a list. You're putting plants in for whatever reason and you're gonna observe them. Turns out stevia is an incredibly late bloomer. Late bloomers are powerful because they're giving those beneficials a final feed before they've got to make it to the winter, you know. If his son didn't love stevia, we may still not have figured out that stevia was a farmscaping plant. It really didn't easily compute, you know. And so don't worry about formulas. Plant things that flower and watch and see what happens, you know. What I like to say is cultivate the fine art of puttering in your garden, you know. Don't always be directed. Go out to the garden and just take it in and let your peripheral vision teach you. And that's when you see the amazing things. That's when you learn these principles and learn how to put them into effect. Um, notice the plants that are above, uh, are abuzz. There are lists, they are okay. It's a good place to start, you know. I can, I can give you a list, I'm happy to give you a list. Don't be bound by it, you know. I'm sure not, you know. Just let what's out there teach you, you know. Um, and create habitat for beneficials. You know, a lot of the things that are really important controls, things like Bacona wasp, are very weak flyers. They're not going to be able, that's why that story wasn't really very accurate, because the average Bacona wasp is not going to fly to Engels parking lot. It'll be lucky to fly from here to the far side of the garden. They're very small, very weak flyers. They, every time you have a habitat, a place where they can land, get out of the sun, maybe get a little sip of water from some dew or something, have a little feed on some nectar and pollen, they're that much stronger, better able to do it. You know, there are different ones. Surfer flies can fly a quarter mile, but a lot of things need to have arborage, you know, shade, food, and water. You know, protection from other predators, because of course they're all being preyed upon. A shot that I won't be able to show you tonight, but I'll, I'm going to rescue from an old computer. Yeah, I have is of a ladybug larva having the life sucked out of it by a, a spine soldier bug. You know, and that's two predators, but one predator is eating the other. It's a tough world out there. You know. They don't really look and see, are, they, are you a beneficial insect? It's like your food. So create, create habitats. We'll look at different ways to create habitats. We'll look at some different habitats out there, okay? Um, and get that it's the entire web of life. You know, everything from baconid wasps and aphid predators to frogs, toads, bats. Bats eat huge numbers of, of bad insects. You know, they have tons of cucumber beetles they find in bats, you know, tons and tons, right? Um, birds, one time at the Highland Lake Inn, we had this huge worry. People wanted me to spray this um, purple, cabbage, purple cauliflower, which was destined to be a gorgeous, um, you know, decoration on plates because they saw cabbage butterflies all over. And I said, I'm going to wait and see. I'm not spraying. I haven't seen any worms yet. I'm not spraying. The worms showed up. I'm thinking, oh, maybe I better spray. I walk out. House sparrows. Supposed pest, right? Bad bird, right? Bad, bad, bad bird, right? They were all hanging out in the barn. They were like a convoy, just flying in, landing in a vase, flying off of the worm, feeding their young, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The FDA would say, bad news, right? We don't want any birds on our food. <laughs> but for those of us that think that it's about life and life is what we want to support and that's how we're going to have a healthy garden, house sparrows are a piece of that, you know? Um, so it can be all that. And my favorite example, biological control, your kid or your grandson. A penny a bug, or depending on the bug, five cents a bug, or maybe nowadays it's 25 cents a bug. But I've ever paid kids to collect bugs and it paid off, you know. So any number of controls, just always try to avoid those broad spectrum insecticides because they set the clock back at zero. And then usually it's not pretty. You can get balance again, but it's usually a mess while balance is being reasserted. And nature will bring us back to balance, but the collateral damage might be your summer crop, you know. Um, let the wild in, you know, and this was actually where I parted ways with Virginia Tech. Tech. I had written something up and I asked Brinkley why it didn't get put in the handout. He said, I can't tell farmers to grow weeds. 
Grow weeds. Weeds are part of the habitat. Don't let them take over your crop. But, I mean, oftentimes they're good food, and they're definitely the, the, part of that deep diversity that you want. So find your niches right here. One of our niches is the stream side. You know, it used to be mowed, and we were losing land like it was going out of style. Now we let it go wild, and it's part of that deep diversity where, it, where insects can, you know, find that arborage where we get insects we don't know about. Both pest and and beneficials, but we don't really care. We want that deep diversity, you know. And so for the average little garden, it might be the ditch next to your garden, you know. It might be like where you're next to your wood pile or something you haven't been able to clean up. But don't look at those weeds and beat yourself up. Those weeds are a piece of it, you know. But wild is the wisdom that we don't have, you know, the wisdom that we can get if we pay attention. So remember that the wild is important too, that we don't know it all and that a big source of our information is the wild and try to have a bit of wild as much as you can on your farm, in your garden. Sometimes I know it's hard. Sometimes it's hard emotionally because you think I'm out of control. But you know what? You are out of control. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You don't want to be completely in control. You will wear yourself out <laughs> and be less successful. Um, hold your fire. This is one of my favorite pieces. I don't know how many times I've had people say, I just squished a million potato beetle bugs on my broccoli. I mean, or, I'm sorry, not bugs, eggs on my broccoli. I go, guess what? Potato beetles aren't going to lay eggs on broccoli. They lay them on potatoes. Maybe eggplant, not broccoli. Guess what you just squished? You just squished a million lady beetle eggs on your broccoli. You know? Or I just squished a million potato beetle larvae on my squash or any other crop, right? If it's not potatoes, the larvae are not going to be there. What you were squishing? is ladybug pupa, which kind of look, if you don't look carefully and don't notice that they're not moving at all, kind of look like potato beetle larva. You know, so people all the time, and by the way, I teach this now. I had to stand on a stage with Dr. McDonald one year and have him show me for the first time what the yellow cocoons of the Baconid wasps, the controls, imported cabbage worm look like. And I had to say, I confess, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I had been crushing those cocoons thinking that they were the eggs of the cross-striped cabbage worm. Um, just not looking close, you know. So I've done it myself, but I've learned deeply from that one. Hold your fire. Usually if you wait, the control comes in. If you go wiping out all the pests, you don't get a control. Potato beetles are a wonderful example. Much as they can terrify you and cause a lot of defoliation, rarely will they impact your crop. Um, and indeed, you let them build up for a little while, and all of a sudden you start seeing a huge array of things that feed on them. You know, not the adults, but the larva. So if you really must control them, just pick the adults. You know? Or what can really make you happy and give you a, a slowdown on their rate of defoliation is simply to knock them to the ground. A lot of them are never going to make it back into the plant because ground beetles, all kinds of other things are going to eat them. They don't move real fast on the soil. And just by waiting a little bit, you let that control come in. And you can get incredible control. If we had more time, I'd tell you stories that are pretty fun about, I mean, literally that's how Richard and I first connected was about the control I was getting at potato beetles. And it was totally accidental. But it's because I had enough for things to feed on them. You know? And it's one of those places, there's certain places where I get loads of good shots of beneficials. And a good bloom of potato beetle larva is a great place to get shots because everything in the world likes to eat them. You know, not the adults. The adults are kind of nasty, but the larva, good eating for those beneficials. So hold your fire and wait and see what comes in. Almost always you have loads of time, and indeed, lots and lots of crops are not only not hurt by some defoliation, but actually at least have their nutrition improved and sometimes have their yield improved. You can actually have a bigger yield from broccoli with up to 40% defoliation from imported cabbage worm. On the other hand, cross-striped cabbage worm, I had to learn right out here that I was holding my fire for too long. Because they're gregarious, they quickly went, and I'll try and show you a shot later on, from 40% to 60 or 70%, and I didn't get a crop. And I called Richard up too late, said, oh no, you gotta spray BT for that one. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we have to spray BT, um, and that's about all you need to control, control the cabbage family um, worms, the things that attack them, BT will do it. But usually for us, the only time we have to spray it is right when the broccoli's forming, because they tend to get in the heads. Or if we have a bad outbreak of the cross-striped cabbage worm. We had loads of control, it just was too late, you know. So it's not like you never shoot, but you really hold your fire. You're a good cop, you know. You really pay attention. You really want to make sure 
that you're not going before the civilian Revo review board. You know, you really want to be sure that you didn't accidentally kill a good guy, accidentally create a bigger problem. Um, okay, next year's solutions are in this year's residues. If you do things right, you leave a garden, and this is really contrary to, contrary to what I used to know. I, I learned originally that sometime in late October, early November, I do a garden cleanup. I get rid of every bit of residue. I clean it all up because that's where all the problems are. It is where all the problems are. It's where all the solutions are, too. <laughs> I mean, once again, it's about balance, right? So when you get rid of all that crop residue, you're taking out everything that controls the pest and the pest. You know? reason for no huh? Oh, big time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, it, it's just, it's real simple. Where in nature is there tillage, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess earthquakes, right? I mean, that's about as close as we get to tillage, you know? Or glaciers, right? I mean, you know, on that level, there's tillage. But essentially, there's some plants that are really good for that. Two really great ones that we'll mention are comfrey and yarrow. Both of those plants, when they die, die in these layers of leaves. And those layers are a great place for beneficials to hang out. And hatch out. And by the way, the pest too. But it's gonna ha the pest is gonna be there anyways. So if the pest hatches out and its control is right there, you're gonna have balance, you know. If the pest has to come in from another garden, it's gonna get there, and the control's not gonna get there until the pest has got is in enough numbers for the control to bother to come in. And by that time, you're gonna be behind the curve. So it's better to just have that residue and let that control be there. This really is a lesson in relaxing. You know, in getting that you're not in charge, that the balance really can occur without you, and that you can actually enjoy allowing that balance to occur. That it can be actually a pretty joyous and educational, much more entertaining than TV. I mean, I, I am way more entertained in the garden than I am by anything on the television. Um, so, you want this source of food, or as I call it on the in this handout, this buffet to open up as early as possible and stay open as late as possible. So my first example of something I want to have happening is pussy willows. They're blooming and putting nectar and pollen out there, sometimes in late February, sometimes mid-February, depends on the first warm spell. And you'll see huge arrays of beneficial insects there. You'll see some pests too. But everybody that can wakes up from their stupor, flies out on a warm day, looks for food. If you've got pussy willows, they're all there feeding. Then they're going to go back in because it's going to get cold again, but they've had a good, f good feed. They're going to make it through that winter. They're going to be in better shape to lay eggs early, and you're going to get a jump on the season. You know? So that's an example of what you can have out early, and there's an array of things, and we'll kind of talk about them as we walk around, that can follow that succession. At the other end, you know, things that are good are things like Jerusalem artichokes will give you a huge feed in the fall. And then the last one of the season, and I don't have it, I've got to re-get it, but it's a, it's a Specific chrysanthemum, it's called Pacifica, very ornamental, expensive. You get it from the fancy farm or hot mail order places like White, White Flower Farm. Um, easy to propagate though, all chrysanthemums are, so you can easily get a lot of them. And at the Highland Lake Inn, we had a row of them at, along one pathway. And I remember walking out to the garden in late October, and we had to protect those because we knew they were going to be gorgeous when they flowered from late frost, which would have killed them. But they're worth protecting because when I walked out, I could hear the buzz from a good hundred feet away. It, was, it wasn't a buzz, it was a roar. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but sometimes you'll, you'll walk up on a place that is a particularly good source of pollen, and the, the roar is actually loud. It's like noticeable. And there just were huge arrays of everything in the world that feeds on nectar and pollen right there, clouds and clouds of it. You know? So you really want to try and come up with those kinds of feeds so you have your, in, your, your diversity. You're not worried. You don't have to pick out, oh, I only want the good guys. You don't care. You just want to see lots of bugs. You want to see them feeding. You want to see them feeding early. You want to see them feeding late. You want to see them feeding all the time. On flowers and on each other. And then we don't have to worry about it. It's taken care of. Um, this is all well and good. Um, but there are problems and we'll talk about them. You know, there are definitely, not everything is taken care of this way. We have invasives. We have some particularly tough bugs like the vine borer on squash. We'll cover those. We'll talk about those as we walk around, okay? Oftentimes, what we think is a pest, things like the potato beetle and stuff like that, they're a major piece of my control system. I can count on them making lots of meat, you know? So if I can just relax and let them do a certain level of predation, 
they make sure that my, my, my predators, my parasitoids, are at high enough numbers to give me control of tougher insects later on. You know, we buy in, Jim just mentioned it, a predator to control bean beetle. But before it gets here, and even while it's here, a piece of that control is many, many other true bugs that will stick their little proboscis into all kinds of soft bodies insects and suck them dry. And if you don't have them, then it's even more critical that that bean beetle predator work. And sometimes it doesn't. If we get a cool summer, it's from India, it doesn't work too good. You gotta be, you know, it could happen. You know, like 2013, it, it was not very good. You know, it was just too cool, it didn't do that well. They didn't get out of control because we had lots and lots of beneficial insects that also feed on the bean beetle larva. Um, that's about it. Um, we'll try and get this printed up because I got a few um, resources there. That's the principles. Any questions before we head out and see what we can see? Let's go out. The first thing we're going to do is we're just going to look at the garden and look at different examples of farmscaping. Then we're going to look close and see if we can see what's going on. See if we can actually see some of this action in the flesh. We'll just kind of look at the garden and appreciate all that's going on in it, you know. Um, and it's really become a pleasure here because if you, haven't, if you may have noticed, I am pretty enthusiastic about this and I talk about it all the time, not just when I'm giving talks. I'm always teaching it. I'm always excited about it. I'm always showing the next example. Kate and Wade can tell you that if there's a, if there's a good beneficial insect thing happening, they will get to see it, you know. I will not, you know, look at it and pass on and not share it. I'll share it with everybody that sees it, right? Right there was, now they're not there anymore, but just a couple weeks ago, covered up with red aphids. That's where all that action was happening. Um, you know, and we have goldenrod in several places, and it's in there because of that. It's actually, you know, a little invasive. You know, it's called stickweed by some people because it makes this hard runner underground. It can, it can be a bit of an unruly guest in the garden, but it's not that hard to control. And not only will it have those aphids in the springtime, but of course then it'll go into flower later on and feed all kinds of beneficials. And anybody that tells you that it's the cause of hay fever, no. You can, definitely, you can have people say, I brought in a bouquet of nothing but um, goldenrod, and my person, my, my aunt who is allergic to, hay, to uh, who gets hay fever, she couldn't stop sneezing. Yes, because the pollen from the ragweed blows onto the goldenrod when you carry it into the house, you're carrying the pollen in. But it's not because of the goldenrod. If you look under a microscope, you can see that the the goldenrod's pollen is not particularly tough for being irritable. The ragweed, on the other hand, looks like a whole bunch of little spines. It's really irritating. So this is our, our typical garden. As many things flowering as possible. Um, some things are passing. We have to get other successions going. We try to have always a flat of farmscaping or several flats of farmscaping, and it's really wonderful. Everybody here has taken the ethic when you plant, you always take a handful of farmscaping plants, right? It's any crop you're putting out, you're sticking some plants out there with it, you know? So there's always more blooming, and that's the ethic, you know? And the truth is, we don't take that good a care of our farmscaping plants. A lot of them are desperate to get in the ground by the time we get them in the ground. Because they really are just a piece of our other processes. But we try to continually seed things so we always have some to put out, you know? So some of the things you're seeing now that are wonderful, um, sunflowers, years ago I bought, um, Aureus insidiosus, the new pirate bug to control fl um, flower thrips. And by the time it arrived, because I ordered them right around the 4th of July, which is a bad time to order through UPS, and my thrips population had crashed. And I called up the person selling them and said, I don't have any thrips anymore. What am I going to do? He said, do you have any source of pollen? I said, I have a lot of sunflowers. He said, no problem. Aureus insidiosus can just as easily eat pollen. So it didn't have any thrips to feed on. It wasn't fed on the sunflowers. Next time the thrips boomed, it went back and got the thrips, you know. So that kind of thing can happen all the time, you know. So you see that we have the Menarda, we have bachelor buttons, bachelor buttons, the blue flower here. Not only does it have beneficial insect flowers that are good, bloom in cold weather too, which is really good, but it has extra floral nectaries. And there's a, there are times when it's not in bloom, it's still putting nectar out. It's putting that nectar out to get other in, get insects that defend it from aphids and stuff like that. Um, so we also have no longer, are barely in bloom, but still in bloom a little bit, cilantro. My joke about cilantro is you can buy varieties of cilantro that are slower to bloom. Um, go to seed, which is what you don't want when you're trying to grow it for, for, for leaf. And they are slower, I've timed it, they're at least 45 minutes slower. You know? <laughs> and that's a plus for us, because we want them to go to seed. I mean, if you go leave tonight and say, I want to get some good flower, plants going right away, cilantro is one of the best things to start. Because in this kind of weather, you go to seed so fast you won't believe it. 
Won't give you a whole lot of leaf, which is frustrating if you want to grow it for leaf, but it's great for flowers, you know. Um, we also have Gloriosa daisy, um, valerian, a wonderful herb. A lot of things are multifunctional. Not only do they bring in the beneficials, but they also give us other benefits. We have fever few. We have lots of herbs that are also beneficials. Most of the culinary herbs are very beneficial. We have some of them here. We have um, lemon balm. We have oregano. We have a variety of, of beneficial um, herbs here too. So we'll look around. We'll walk and see if there's any action right now. This is an okay time. It's not the prime time for the beneficials to be out. It was a little earlier, but it's okay. Um, and it's good to know that there's many ways that these plants are good to have. Not only is this, here are the flowers still, you know, and they're still, and you can see there's some good guys flying around, you know, a little surface fly there, you know, there's definitely some, some activity here. But after it's done, we get the seed. And here, this is a bug, and this is probably not a good bug, quote, quote, but you know what, I don't really care. There's no such thing as good bugs to me. It's not a particularly bad one. I don't know it as a, as a major pest, but it doesn't look like a predator to me. Um, it's probably a, sea, a feeder, a, a, a foliage feeder, and you can always know you're going to find bugs when there are seeds happening. Bugs really like to be where there are seeds happening. So I can kind of, and the other day I found a two-spotted stink bug in here. Actually, I didn't. My partner Diane did. Um, I almost got a picture of it. It flew away right when I got into the shade for the picture. He's pretty confused. Yeah, he's a little confused. And I don't need, you know, some people say, okay, well, it's not a good bug, so I'll kill it. Right. No, no, no. You're not God. You don't know. We don't know, you know, we really don't know. I've also had people say, um, well, why would I plant morning glory? It's not a beneficial. It's like, we don't know. We have no idea what morning glory is doing. We know some things. There's so much more to learn. I plant morning glories because they're gorgeous, because they make me happy. And someday I may find out there's another reason. But meanwhile, I don't care. That's a darn good reason, you know? right there. The good news is if you do that, you get the balance. You know, you have enough stuff and nature figures out what works for what. Right next, this is really a good mix of beneficials here because you have the borage. Borage is a um, really deep-rooted bioaccumulator, right? It's in, in Italy. It's used lightly with other greens. It adds a real distinctive flavor. The FDA will tell you that it's carcinogenic. The Italians have been eating it forever. I don't see them all dying of, of cancer, so what's going on there? Carcinogenic, if you eat a few bales of it, you know? Um, but really, self-seeds, provides flowers. If we had time right now, I'd give you the, my little taste test, which is you taste one and I ask you what it tastes like and nobody knows, and then once, once out of every thousand people, somebody gets it. Very subtle taste of cucumber, but it's fun. People like to put it in ice cubes and freeze it or put it on salads. But for us, the main thing is that it's feeding the beneficials, you know? So then right there we have valerian. Valerian's a wonderful herb. It's a nervine. It's the big, the big bunch of white blossoms right next to the um, goldenrod there. Um, it's a really good one. Down here we have smartweed. Um, that's really a bad guy. You know, the, per, the, purple, the pink flowers there. Okay, what's good about it is it's major harborage for big-eyed bugs which feed on flea beetles. Now, that doesn't mean you have to let it take over your garden. But you could have some wild corners so that those big-eyed bugs have a place to reproduce. You could also grow Vietnamese cilantro, which is in the same family and provides the same kind of conditions, but is actually something you can use and not nearly as poorly behaved as smartweed. You know? um, and so, yeah, I want to say let things be wild, but you still have to have a garden, so you have to control the weeds. But maybe in the pathway sometimes, it's just where you can let a little bit of wildness happen is a good thing. You know, you don't want to let it get out of control. You certainly don't want to let it, let it go to seed so it's a big problem next year. But if we can just lighten up a little bit, you know, and get that everything has something to teach us and that there are moments where it's good to have maybe a weed for a while. Maybe you're going to wipe it out before it sets seed. There'll be plenty of other seeds. It'll come back, you know. But that kind of concept is where we are going to get more control. Um, yes, calendula. Calendula and... Um, Bachelor buttons are really stars because they can be blooming for 10 months out of the year, you know? And they, all, they both make abundant volunteers, you know? So you can move them around easily and have them all the time. And calendula is a spectacular herb, you know? Really good for us for many reasons. Um, and both of them are edible flowers. They work really nicely in salads, you know? Um, they're just really delightful plants. We have over there lemon balm. Lemon balm is a major nervine, really good for um, shingles. It's antiviral. Um, I know people who have 
cured themselves of shingles by drinking lots of lemon balm tea. And the German, um, Germany has a, a system whereby they vet herbs and they've documented that it works for shingles, you know. So that's the good thing is that these beneficials can all have many other uses. Then we have a little bit of wild there. That's gallon soga in there. Gallon soga is a, a very abundant weed. Um, to us, it's nothing but a weed. The Colombians, it's a part of their national dish. If you go to the Colombian embassy's homepage, that weed is on it. It's part of a recipe, you know. So once again, just getting the concept that there are many different uses for plants. Then we have yarrow. Um, yarrow is an, a continually blooming um, herb. And once again, it just it adds loads of good color and structure in the garden, but has many other uses. But what for this talk, what's best about it is it's that open face kind of flower, real easy for the smaller insects to feed on. You know, some of our flowers in the garden really don't feed the beneficials very well. They feed the quote, quote, pest, the butterflies. Why do we think of butterflies as pests? You know, some of them are, you know, the imported cabbage worm. That's that white butterfly with a little dark spot, you know, it's a pest. So what, you know, if you have the balance, you don't have to worry about it. You know, it rarely is a problem in the garden. Yarrow also is incredibly beneficial um, as an herb. Um, its Latin name is Achillea, named because of Achilles. And if you get yourself a deep cut, the old English meaning for yarrow is spear heal, and it will heal a deep wound incredibly quickly. So it's a great thing to have in the garden. I've given myself some pretty stupid cuts sometimes when I was in a hurry to get to market or something, and I could simply chew up a piece of yarrow, put it on that deep cut, tie it with a piece of grass. The wound stops throbbing immediately, stops bleeding immediately, heals perfectly in a, in a day, you know? Incredible what it does. Um, this is a great example of a beneficial plant. I learned this from Brinkley Benson, the same man that taught me about um, stevia. This is known as a cup plant. And all praise to Craig Siska, who speaks only about Latin names. I showed him this and he wrote me back and said, can I get some of your Cephilium perforatium or something like that, right? And I don't know the Latin name. But I had to look it up because I had no idea what it was. Oh, cup plant. While I was there, I read about it. I didn't know this plant. We, we love it because of the cups. See that? Mm -hmm. It holds water. What did I talk about needing ar har harborage, water, shade, and food? This has water in the garden all the time. It catches the rainwater, but even dew will run down and make a little pool. And it's because of the slope, you don't see a lot of insects dying in it. A little bit, you know? I mean, some always drown, but not as many. So it's a really great place for the beneficial insects to get a drink and move on. But in reading about it, it's high enough in protein that it's an important forage crop that should be, we should be planting it in the pastures. Um, it has a continuous bloom for about three to four weeks of composite flowers in midsummer, so it's feeding the beneficials. Turns out that the Indians would cut it off and make a resin that they chewed, and it freshened the breath, but more importantly, relieved nausea. So they made a gum out of it, you know. Many other uses besides that, and that's very typical. As you start to put plants out, you put them out first because you like them, second because you see that they're bringing in the diversity you want, and then you start to learn all the other uses of those plants, you know. So this is really a system of relaxing into a riot of diversity. That is what it's all about. And you can see we got quite a riot going on out here, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a better example of the um, cilantro in bloom. You can see there's some ants feeding on that. Ants are in the same family as wasps. So in a different moment, there'd be loads of wasps out here and many wasps lay their eggs and the bad guys and their babies eat the bad guys, supposed bad guys. Um, so it's a great so source of control. More valerian, more gloriosa daisy. Um, something we do all the time is let vegetables go to seed. And why would we do that, right? They stay in longer, they might get a disease. You got a problem, right? This is about to go to seed. This is lettuce because very often the insects that lay their eggs next to or in the things that feed on the crop love to feed on the flowers of that crop. So the adults will come in. A favorite food for Bacon and wasps that lay their eggs in the cabbage worms is brassica flowers. You know? So a very easy way to have more diversity is by letting some of your vegetables go to seed. It's also good for you 
I believe, because you get a sense of the full cycle. And I actually have gotten to this kind of weird spiritual place where I think it's important for the plant. It's important that you let the plant have its full cycle at least once in a while, you know. That, there's no science there, you know, I'm sure, you know, if somebody watches this and they're just science-based, they'll be rolling their eyes at that. That's okay. It's good exercise, you know. That's more valerian. Oh, this here? Yeah. That's more calendula. Okay, that's a different tone. Yeah, it's a different colors. And, you know, I'm afraid that it's just a little early. Uh -huh. um, and so I don't know that the seed is ripe. But there might be some ripe seed. And if you see some that's ripe, you're welcome to take some. It makes tons of seed. Huh. And you're very, are you welcome to come back and get some? You know, yeah. we always have tons. And that's the fun thing. A lot of these things, mm -hmm. they re will reproduce themselves. We don't have as much volunteering as I've had in some gardens because we are so reliant on mulch, mm -hmm. you know, and that doesn't give them as much of a chance to come along. And, and no-till where we knock down something and plant through it. So the, that system helps us to control weeds, but also controls our volunteers. Mm -hmm. So it's not as good for us, you know. What'd you say this was? I'm sorry. That's Gloriosa daisy. That's a favorite of mine. The variety that's here is not as much fun for me as the one I had at Highland Lake. Highland Lake, there was more genetic drift, uh -huh. so I had more variation of color. And they also could get a lot bigger. And I think that's just the seed, you know. And so I should really be selecting the biggest ones and the ones that are most commonly changing. Because I really love, I love watching flowers that when they come up again have changed, you know. I love watching that kind of genetic drift, you know. And that's really, what I want to get across to you is that this is not, this is not a tough regime. This is called have fun in your garden while it becomes a paradise. You know, you don't have to come out and worry about the insects. Just grow a bunch of stuff that you enjoy watching. And then you can start enjoying watching the insects, creating the balance that you need. You know, it's pretty effective. And we will spend some time on the things that this doesn't work for. It works for most things, though. We, my favorite um, recent story about this is we have Marshall Hagen working with us. And Marshall Hagen came from a, going to school for agriculture and then working on hundreds and hundreds of acres of conventional tomatoes, peppers, and squash, and things like that. You know, having his own farm, his own business, you know. And then because of the really hard economics of that uh, market, losing his shirt one year when the bottom fell out of the tomato market, just when he needed to be making money on tomatoes. And so he came to work with us, and he really didn't believe in organic much at all. And he's seen the effects of compost tea, seen the effects of balance, and seeing the, that this vigor can really help to control disease. And he's very impressed and excited about a lot of things, particularly compost tea, biochar, no-till, and stuff like that. Second year that I was working with him, he said, okay, so I'm ready now for you to teach me what I need to spray for the bugs. I didn't spray for bugs at all last year. And I said, well, let's see if we need to spray. And we walked around, we looked at things, and there were a few cucumber beetles, not too many, you know. There were a few aphids, nothing that the balance couldn't handle. I said, later on, we will need to spray for the vine borer, but right now, you don't need to spray. And he was like, that's insane. That's insane. You don't have to spray for any bugs? That's crazy. I don't believe that. You know? But it's really true. If you spray once, you've got to keep spraying because you lose the balance. But if you just let the balance happen and can take a little damage. And the good news about the damage, which I forgot to tell you back there, is that we now know that when insects eat plants, the plants defend themselves by making more antioxidants. So that food in the market that doesn't look as good because it's got bites in it, it's better for you. It's actually, it's actually healthier for you because the plant, and it makes sense, we evolved with all this, right? Of course our body would learn to use the, the things that the plants used to defend themselves to nourish us. So it really does work to let a little happen, hold your fire, and you get control. Um, but you know, I'd plant tons of sunflowers if they didn't do a darn bit of good. And I should tell you that I am no fan of pollenless sunflowers. <laughs> If you're in the biz, if you're selling sunflowers for money, you all want pollenless sunflowers because we don't want to get pollen on our tablecloths. They'll stay in the tablecloths. I say, put something under that tablecloth. <laughs> Let the pollen happen because they'll still get nectar, but you're using a, losing a huge boost for your beneficials if you grow the pollenless sunflowers. You know? Or maybe grow some that are, that are pollenless for those special moments where you have to put them on an expensive tablecloth. But most people can probably cope with a little bit of pollen. You know? Meanwhile, the beneficials are going to feed like crazy. And it's not just, by the way, it's not just the, bit, the bugs. Once they make seed, all kinds of birds are going to come in and feed on those seeds. You know? And lots of those birds may mostly eat seeds, but it's a rare organism that doesn't avail itself of every food opportunity. So if they suddenly come across a nice little burst of insects, just like a robber fly will eat aphids like they're corn on the cob, 
some of those seed-eating birds are also going to eat insects, you know? And all of those little pieces, right, those little bits of predation here and there, that's the web that gives you balance. That's what keeps us from having the big swings, you know? If you just have the main predator and the main prey, like the lynx and the hare, you're bound to have the crashes. It's when you have all this diversity, then things are stable. And that's really what we're looking at here. We don't have to look a lot more at this right now. We can, it's kind of like a repetition. That's the good news. We don't have to go over and over it. Um, but I'm trying to see if there's any examples of stuff that we haven't yet looked closely at. Um, well, right here is good. This is chamomile and feverfew. Feverfew is a perennial. Chamomile is what I call a perennially self-seeding annual. And the combination, this is actually all, all feverfew here, but we also have chamomile. Um, and these guys, I mean, both really good herbs, really good for you for many reasons, but also abundant flowers, you know. And you just, you can see we just have a, an array of stuff. And actually, I'll admit that as you head further over, we don't need to go look, but we get over to a point where there isn't nearly as much diversity because what we had out for diversity there is finishing. It's because it's mostly garlic and onions they are about to come out. So the plants we had in that provided diversity have finished, have gone to seed, but we're going to be pulling out the crop. We no longer have to worry much about insects. And then as we replant, we'll start to stick more back in, you know. Um, and we have less perennials. The perennials are on the edges, but we're able to have more perennials all the time as we go to more and more no-till. Perennials don't work very well with tillage. They work a lot better if you don't till. So we're getting more yarrow on the edges, the um, fever few, getting more patches of the perennials um, as it goes. And then we're learning some things, you know. Are you letting a lot of your annuals seed or not? We let them seed, but we don't get as many to come up because we use no-till practices and stuff that they just, just like the, the no-till practices suppress the weeds, they also suppress the volunteers. So we usually have to plant out. I have had other systems, like I did at Highland Lake, where most of the beneficial plants took care of themselves. But we spent a lot more time weeding, you know, and then we could see the good ones and leave them. Yeah. This here, this is Doc. And Doc is not a beneficial, as far as I know, for insects. There is a beetle that controls it, that helps to keep it controlled. It puts out a whole lot of seed. A whole lot of seed, and it's kind of a pain. And it's what's really bad about it, yeah, it's hard to dig out. What's really bad about it is it's an alternate host for Cicospora, the thing that puts the red dots on beets and chard, uh -huh. and then eventually gets it shot full of holes. Uh -huh. So it's not my favorite, but it's very medicinal yeah. if it's yellow dock. And we're going to have a workshop that's going to talk all about that in July with Jackie Greenfield and Amy Hamilton. I highly encourage it. Yellow dock. Pardon? That's not yellow. Well, what I've learned is they hybridize. Huh. And now we can't really tell except for by the seed. And the seed has a wing on it. And then you know that it's got the medicinal properties. But I'm going to learn more, and if you come, you will too. You know, I'm no expert in that. You said you can feed them to the black soldier flies too, the seeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any seed is going to be fine food for the black soldier flies, you know. Um, there's, there's always a use for everything. Doc has its place. That's also an indicator that the soil is wet, and our soil is wet. You know? <laughs> that's just part of what we have here, you know. So this is what's going on here. Oh, that's, I'm glad I looked there. The alliums, the stray alliums that are blooming there, we leave them. And you'll see once they hit a certain level of bloom, clouds of insects, you know. And so I might as well mention the families that are best for beneficial insects, and there's a bunch of them, and I'm sure I'm missing some. But the mint family, the composite family, which includes things like lettuce, but also sunflowers, dahlias, goldenrod. Um, the, they used to call it um, umbellifera family, now they call it apaca family, the carrot family, which includes things like um, cilantro, but also as we pass by, we'll look at number two and we'll see some gorgeous um, parsnips in bloom. You know, really wonderful for that. Queen Anne's lace, you know, all of those are wonderful for beneficial insects. Um, the legume family is actually very good. The legume family has a lot of plants that have extra floral nectaries. Um, let's see, what am I forgetting here now? Carrot. What's that? That's really pretty. The yarrow? That's yarrow? Yeah, yarrow, yeah, yeah. Boy, it is pretty, and by the way, anybody that wants can get themselves a piece with root on and multiply it and have it, you know. But I will tell you that the, the herbalists are convinced that the cultivar is not as medicinal as the white wild one. I think that's usually true. When we breed for color and stuff, we oftentimes give up something. Oftentimes what we give up is vigor, but sometimes the vigor also is what's medicinal about it. Um, I can also tell you that we didn't have the white wild one in here, and Meredith, right before the grower's school, cut her finger to the bone. 
while she was cutting up a, uh, an animal that she was going to be showing how to butcher the next day. And Diane remembered to run out and get the arrow and put it on, stop the bleeding right away, you know, even though it wasn't the most medicinal. So we just planted a white one. It's good to have the white one. We want the colored ones too because we love the color and the beneficials like both. If we had some colored yarrow that's now white, what, is, what happened there? Um, I think probably what happened is that, the, uh, that there was also the um, native one or the wild one that just outcompeted it and took over. I don't know that they would, because it's a perennial, I don't see how, short of radiation, I don't see how you're going to get a change in the genetics, you know, once it has those genetics. So I think it probably just got outcompeted and you went to a white. You can get color from here. Take, take a piece of each colored one. We got plenty. We have to eventually start knocking it back because it gets too big. But we let it get pretty far before we knock it back because we love it, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a gorgeous plant. And I remember now, when it dies, it's where a whole lot of beneficials hang out. So that's a plus too. Okay. Um, actually, important to mention for anybody that doesn't know it. Everybody know this plant? Plantain. This is the plant that lets you relax when your garden is a buzz. Because some of the things that are a buzz sting, right? And it's very common for Americans who have not gotten comfortable with the natural world to want to stay away and run away when they hear buzzing insects. Please know that all you have to do is chew this up, put it on that sting, keep chewing it up, keep renewing it, and within 15 minutes to at the most a half an hour, the worst of stings will go away for most people. I'm not going to say that if you get anaphylactic shock, you couldn't take your EpiPen. But for most of us, this is a solution. What is it again? This is plantain. Okay. Um, wide plantain. The wide leaf plantain. There's also a narrow leaf. We'll see that probably too. You know. They, and they both work. They both work great. Yeah. Though I have heard something that some people think that certain ones work better for certain ethnicities. I have no idea if that's true. Oh. Yeah. Well. It could be. You know, it's uh, little, the lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters is a wonderful plant and sometimes gets aphids. I don't notice a lot of beneficial insect activity on it, which is why I didn't mention it. If it's got aphids, they'll, then they'll feed the beneficials. But, yeah, right, and right there's a lightning bug. And the whole Lampyrid family is beneficial. So it's arborage for all kinds of insect life. It's a favorite plant of mine. I love it. I love to eat it. I love to eat lots of it. When is it good to eat? It's good to eat almost at any time. When it goes to flower, it's a little tougher, but I can even eat it then. Right now, this, if you haven't had it, grab a handful and take it home and eat it. It's, it's, it's in the same family as spinach. The family is named Chenopodium, which means goosefoot. You can see why, you know. Um, it is great eating. It's incredibly loaded with nutrients. It does have a fair amount of oxalic acid, which makes some people worry. If you're eating enough vegetables, I don't think you have to worry about oxalic acid. This is, I like this more than spinach cooked, you know. Um, it, to me, it's, it's meatier. It's the same kind of flavor, but it's meatier. So I really, I highly recommend it. Um, there's also a cultivar that's pink that they now put in the catalogs and sell as magenta spring. They didn't think anybody would buy lamb's quarters. You know? <laughs> and um, I had an intern once who said, I planted a whole bed of quinoa, but I had to pull it all out because it all came up lamb's quarters. Yeah. It's a first cousin. They look exactly the same. <laughs> you know? so she pulled up her quinoa. So every plant has its purpose. And now that you've asked me, I'll try and figure out the name of it. But... I must confess, oh, dill's another great one, by the way. Um, let's go down and take a look at that one. Then we'll go to the greenhouse and see what we can see in the world of beneficials. The biggest um, disappointment in the world of controlling insects is the most popular beneficial insect plant. What is that? Basil. What? Basil. No, that's a great beneficial insect plant. This is one that you always, people always plant to help keep bugs out of the garden. What is it? Marigold? Yeah, utterly useless. Oh, really? <laughs> really, really useless. What'd you call the it? Marigolds. Marigold. Oh. The theory is that they smell so, so strong that the insects can't find them. Mm -hmm. The insects that aren't starving, but most insects are hungry enough that they get past that. Mm -hmm. And what you want is plants that are a buzz. Look at marigolds. See how many insects are around there. Mm -hmm. They're just not very good food. Mm -hmm. you know? for nematode expression and... Yeah, if, you, if you're down in the hot lands, then you want to grow one. Yeah. The African marigold, mm -hmm. which I love. It's got a wonderful smell. It's not at all showy right? It gets tall. That's a great one for that issue, right? You can also grow things like Sudex. There are lots of nematicidal plants, you know, but up here, nematodes aren't an issue, you know, but people grow tons of marigolds. They're wasting good space on beneficials. Not that I don't want to grow a few, 
I can enjoy the flowers. Um, their weird smell kind of is fun to experience a little bit in the garden if I don't have too much of it. But they're a bust when it comes to beneficial insect plantings. Back way off on the marigolds and get a whole lot more diversity in there. How about Where the do you uh, with cosmos? They're good. They're not, they're not spectacular, but they're good and we love them. So why not have them? We always put a bunch out, you know. They're not the best, you know. But they, you definitely will see beneficial, you'll see way more on them than you will on the marigolds. Yeah. Where do you get your landscape fabric? Um, I get it from Troy's Greenhouse in Burnsville. We I've buy it by there. the pallet and get a good price. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's the best place to get a deal. Me, Make the order, I'll, pull it, I'll bring it down for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I go through every, and I love a good reason to stop by and talk to my friend yeah. Wade. You know, he's one of my heroes. So let's go down and see what you're looking at here. Is it not goldenrod you were looking at? I was seeing these right here. That's goldenrod. Okay. Yeah, that's what you're seeing. And it's in the same family that's as echinacea. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah. We do have some echinacea out there. We lost a bunch. I'm going to have to plant a bunch more. Mm -hmm. I really want to get Augustifolium going. It's harder to yeah. start. Yeah. But it it's, has other medicinal benefits. It's easy to grow papura, and so I, we grow that all the time. But I want to get a bunch of Augustifolium going, too. Um, okay, so let's go look in the greenhouse and see some of the activity. But before we go to number three, let's wander back and see what's happening here on our parsnips. And I have a, a story I love to share about the parsnips. Um, years ago, I was the head gardener at the Highland Lake Inn. And my mission was to get food on the plate, right? It was one of the very first farm-to-table places, right? This is the early 90s. And we were into farm to table big time. And I got there and I was on fire. I wanted as much food on the plate as I can get, right? So I established three, I think, 80 foot rows of parsnips. And I was just so happy thinking about all the wonderful parsnips we were gonna dig the next spring and all the good things they can do with those, you know? And I gave them recipes, parsnip patties with tarragon and lemon, really, you know, delicious things that were unusual and all that. Went through the two rows. And Tresca Lindsay, the matriarch of the family, came down and said, Pat, leave that last row on the ground. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I want that on the plate. We, got, we don't have much else. I was counting on that for the plate. She said, believe me, you'll agree with me when you see it in bloom. Mm -hmm. And she was in charge. I had, to let her, I had to do what she said, right? But I was really riling at it. I wanted that food on the plate. Then I walked down in the springtime. Can you imagine 80 feet of that in bloom? Oh my gosh. Absolutely gorgeous. I was like, Tresca, you were right. Then I looked close and saw clouds of insects, clouds of insects. And early on, loads of C-Mac ladybug and Pennsylvania soldier beetle. And it was right next to our asparagus. And now when I teach, I always recommend you let parsnips go to seed in your asparagus patch. There'll be a little window where you've stopped harvesting. Once you stop harvesting, that's when you start to have asparagus beetle problems big time, because you're no longer, when you harvest, you're taking the eggs away, right? The eggs are those little black hairs on the side of the spears. And you take those away, and so there's not many beetles because you're cooking the eggs or washing them off or whatever. Once you stop doing that, then the beetles get to mature and they start to become a problem. Within three weeks, this is in bloom. In come the Pennsylvania soldier beetle and the C-Mac, and the problem goes away. You know? So if you had one other source of nectar and pollen for that three-week window, you'd probably never have to worry about asparagus beetles at all. Mm -hmm. And by and large, we haven't because we have enough other stuff blooming that the beneficials come in early and take care of it for us. So let's just wander back there and see if we can see any activity. I want to warn you though, um, if you're going to bathe before you're out in the sun tomorrow, it probably won't be a problem. But if you get the oil of this plant on you and you're sensitive, you can get a, a dermal effect, like a red mark. It won't hurt, but it could last for weeks. So you don't want to get the oil on and be out in the strong sun. That's how it works. It's the oil in the sun. I'm not particularly affected by it. Do you know if fennel is in the same family? Oh, it is, absolutely. The fennel looks a lot like this. Fennel's in the exact same family. So, okay, right here, ladybug larva. I'll let you all come in close and look at it. We have ladybug in here. We also have squash beetle, surfeit fly up there, more ladybugs, loads of ladybugs. Yeah, loads of ladybugs. And I guarantee you'll also have surfeit fly in here. Um, I'm looking for C-Mac. I'm not seeing it, but it's probably here. So just I'll let you all come in and look, and if you find something interesting, see if you can catch it and ask me, okay? I'm going to get out of the way. Pat, there's a black beetle on this one. Bring it to me if you can catch it. Okay, there are a bunch of beneficial flies. Um, if they're feeding on nectar and pollen, they're probably not the common house fly. He's got his bug on Okay. 
By the way, I can't guarantee I'm going to identify everything. That's a seed feeder. Um, I don't think it's a particularly um, notable beneficial. Are, these, are the flowers edible? The flowers, um, I think the flowers might be edible. The pollen is, is, is um, you know, no, that's fennel pollen. Fennel pollen can be sprinkled on things. I don't know that I'd eat the flowers of the parsnip, tell you the truth. What's that? What is this one? That's a ladybug larva. And I was looking for the eggs that you right said. There? Well, the eggs would be on the asparagus, not on this, right? Oh, so I thought you pointed something out. Oh, no, I don't think I've shown any eggs here. I showed the ladybug larva, but I don't think I've showed any eggs on this. There could be eggs on this. There could be lacewing larva, but usually the eggs on, are on a place where the pests are, you know? And there aren't as many pests here. There's mostly predators. There are a lot of eggs over here. You got a lot of eggs? Let's see them. Okay, show, show that to people. See, I don't even have to teach this. All of my friends and co-workers now <laughs> know how to teach it. I it. It's pretty, if you found a Pennsylvania soldier beetle alone, that's a rarity. Let me see if I can get in and see it there. Oh, that's Pennsylvania soldier beetle. Yep. And it's actually a rarity. Usually they're mating. They're almost yeah. always mating. It's pretty rare to see them not mating, don't you think? <laughs> that's all I saw last year. Yeah. I tease my friend Jackie. I'm actually from Scranton, PA, too, but she's from, she always goes, and there's a Pennsylvania soldier beetle because she's from Pennsylvania. I go, no, no, it's the North Carolina soldier beetle here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the Pennsylvania soldier beetle. Anyway, you can see, and actually, different times of day, and actually earlier in the season, these flowers are getting close to going to seed. There's not only all of these crawlers, but there's clouds of little insects, too, and those are the baconid wasp, the surfeit flies. All of them are just buzzing in and feeding, just clouds and clouds, you know. So this is a spectacular plant to let go to seed in your garden. And the good news is, you can have parsnips on automatic. You can dig a lot of them and just let some of them go to seed. You know? And they know when to plant themselves better than I do. I miss the window real often. But my volunteers always pop up. Um, so it's, it's one of those examples, you know, and I mean, we could sit here and count, but there's probably, you know, at least 50 ladybugs in here. Um, and we saw one or two larvae. I guarantee you there are many, many more larvae. Um, I'm disappointed. CMAC is just not that abundant in this garden. Other parts of, the f of different farms that we have, there are lots of CMAC. For some reason, we don't have a lot of that here. But I will show you a picture of it. It's one of my iconic bugs. It's one of the ones that I, you know, I, have a, I resonate with. A bunch of them are just in here feeding, just doing their thing, you know. But look at these plants. You probably will find very few aphids, very few insect problems. Um, okay, yeah, right here, this is a fun one to see. Sweet alyssum. It's really impressive that it's still in bloom in the garden because it's so hot. And then right next to it, a largely unknown one that I highly recommend, Facilia tanacetifolia, or tanacetifolium, tansy leaf facilia. Facilia is in the same family as borage and comfrey, very deep rooted, a major bioaccumulator. Dr. Elaine Ingham has taught me that it also fixes nitrogen even though it's not a legume, but really powerful for, for feeding pollinators. Indeed, Jeremy Grice, who I work with, says that he's read online that people say, make sure it's not in bloom when you have a crop you want to have pollinated, because they'll all be over at the facilia and not pollinating your crop. Um, and so this combination here is just a delightful little corner of farmscaping. Why the alyssum is still in bloom, I'm clueless, because it really doesn't like the heat. But I'm grateful, and it's a good self-seeder, so hopefully it'll come back there. Okay, so we're going to do this pretty quick. And then we'll go upstairs if people want to and look at anything we didn't see. We're already coming close to the end of the time. All the time, we want buckwheat in bloom. Buckwheat's an incredible nectary. You can keep it in bloom, by the way. Come through with the weed eater and just cut it down a few nodes, and it'll just start to make flowers again. You can get the same buckwheat to bloom for the entire season. We seed it with other beneficial um, cover crops that make more biomass. We've got cow peas in there. We've got sudex in there. The buckwheat will be the beginning of it, but we'll have other stuff happening. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've got rye over here, and it's going to seed, mm -hmm. and it's got pollen, so it's feeding beneficials. Our cover crops are our major piece of the food. Is this the seed of it? No, it's going to seed, but that's that's part of the that's the um, the flowers, those? you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the seed is going to be these guys in here when they get I, bigger. I planted yeah. buckwheat, and I was wondering if. No, that that's not buckwheat seed. now. That is that's or, rye. Rye. Yeah. I mean yeah. rye. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, the seed will be nice big grains in here. Okay. Okay, so then over here, these are the cucumbers I talked about. And so that's all aphid damage and what happened afterwards. But then what came in and they fed on it was ladybugs. There's a ladybug pupa. Uh -huh. 
you know. Um, there's another ladybug pupa. I don't think we're going to see as many larvae because they're about done now, you know, but there were loads of them. What's, uh... Here we have the eggs, probably the eggs of the bean beetle. There's the, the husk of a ladybug pupa. Uh -huh. That looks like a, a ladybug larva that didn't make it. Yeah. Something happened to that one. Um, come on by, just turn the leaves over and take a look. Here's a ladybug larva. Yeah, those are beautiful. You know, um, ladybugs. This is such a, such a wide area. What is your average temperature during, like, let's say it's 90 outside. What's it going to be? It's going to be above 90. Is that the pupa of the ladybug? Yeah, it is. It should have, did you take it off? Oh, yeah, so you don't want to do that. Yeah, don't take them off. Die. Yeah. Well, just see if you can try and set it in a, in a crotch or someplace, okay? If they're attached, let them be. But yes, that's the pupa. It's pretty yeah. cool right now, though. Yeah. Yeah, I know. The fan really helps, you know? The reason I asked, because it was 96 outside and it was 110 in my greenhouse. Yeah, you want as much ventilation as possible. We took the plastic out of that end. We're probably going to take the other ends out. But the surround will really help you with that, you know? Yeah, okay. I'm going to yeah. put that up. I yeah. have it. So the reason you don't want to take them off is if they drop to the ground, somebody's going to eat them, you know? Yeah, their their so odds are way better up there on the leaf, yeah, yeah. you know? I got them back on there. Okay, good. So. Okay, those are the eggs of a bug. It could very well be a beneficial. Oh, look at oh here. Right here we have lacewing eggs. Where? They're those little things on the little sticks. See how they stick up like that? Yes, right there. The reason why they're up in the air is lace wings are so voracious uh -huh. that if they hatch out, they'll eat each other. So uh -huh. Mama figured out, I better get these guys up in the air so they don't see each other at first. That's and they wander off and look for something else to eat, you know? Um, but she lays them in uh -huh. where there's a lot of aphids. That's why we have so many predators here, because there were so many aphids, uh -huh. you know? Did you release ladybugs? Or did Not at all. We just had aphids. Yeah, they can. And you let awesome. you hold your fire, yeah. and it's the amazing. control comes yeah, in. Yeah. I've never seen so many. Well, and then lace wing eggs. Look at all the lace wing eggs. You know. Yeah, it's crazy. Tons it's of them. Crazy. You know. Really now, what was this egg formation? It was. I yellow. think that I think that's probably some kind of true bug, probably a beneficial, uh -huh. but I don't know it. So everybody that hasn't seen the lace wing eggs, come on up close and take a look. They're pretty fine. You got to get close. All in there. See how they're all on these little sticks, the little white things on the little sticks. Okay. Yeah. That's lace wing eggs, okay? Okay, they're good. Yep. What's this guy next to the ladybug? That is the remains of a lace wing, um, I mean of a ladybug, ladybug pupa. It's empty now, right? Um, oh. And that's another, that, that, that's not a ladybug, that's a pupa, right? That one's been emptied, that one there is still a pupa, oh. okay? We have lots of husks of where there have been ladybugs. There were far more, um, ladybug larva but now they've all pupated and we have far more of the there's see this one here is pretty perfect because it is about to pupate it was a larva oh, yeah. but see how it's getting kind of fat yes. and kind of attached so it's going into pupation yeah. and there's a larva that hasn't started to pupate yet yes. you know yeah. so um loads of beneficial activity because of that aphid bloom i talked about this in here we're getting to see it you know and not so much here. These are healthier, right? Uh -huh. So here we don't have the same level of activity. You get down here and you'll start to see more of the same. No, you won't see it here because of surround. Surround is this fine clay that we spray to get control. It's the stuff that gets in the sphericals of the insects. So everybody leaves when we do that, you know? That's why it's kind of okay they didn't spray the surround last week because I want you to see this stuff. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of hold our fire until you got, all got here, you know? Yep, we mix it with water. It yeah. No, we it? mix it with water. Okay. That's the lace that's the ladybug larva. I think yeah. they're beautiful. Oh they are. They're gorgeous. Yeah. They're like little They're dragons. absolutely gorgeous, yeah. I think of them as the little alligators, but yeah. dragons, yeah. alligators, yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um by the way, somebody asked me about a fly on the parsnip and I got distracted and didn't answer. There are loads of beneficial flies. Years ago I kept seeing a fly coming up to the butt of potato beetle larva. And I thought, is it feeding on, on the exudate from the potato beetle larva? I sent the picture to Richard. The name begins with an I-S-C-H, and it's a specific fly that lays its eggs in the potato beetle larva. So it was just getting up, getting ready to oviposit into that larva. It looked like any old house fly, you know? So watch what you swat. If it's not in your house bothering it, bothering you, it's probably not a house fly. You know, let it be. Okay, let's come back down here. We'll go to the squash. 
and we'll see if there's more activity on the squash. Oh yeah, we'll talk about it. Okay, here's a different kind of ladybug larva. It's a, just a different, you know, there are many different ladies bugs. Richard teaches us all about them and I, I always forget because I don't have to know. Uh -huh. you know. I just know they're all doing their job. That's all you you know. So there also could be a surfer fly larva in here. I'm hoping to see one of those. Um, there could be um, lacewing larva. That is the squash bug, squash beetle. That's a pest. Some sort. Okay, these are the eggs of the squash bug. This is a pest. Yeah. These wonderful, gorgeous little golden bronzy eggs. That's a pest. What do you recommend? Um, okay, so now is a good time to call. What I'll do right here is just knock them off. Their odds are very poor if they're not on here. Um, but now is a good time to talk about the control for um, vine borer. How many people have trouble with vine borer on squash? Okay, it can be heartbreaking, right? It can really take your squash down. There's not a really good control for that because it lays its egg right at the base and very quickly bores in. So unless you have incredibly high levels of egg predators, you don't get good control. The control is spraying twice a week with a, a, a soap, either Safer's insecticidal soap or MP, or if you want to do a home remedy, ivory flakes are one of the least phytotoxic, but some kind of soap twice a week and Bacillus thuringiensis, right? Dipel dry flowable is the one that's allowed that I know the name of in organic. There's another one that's allowed in organic, right? Spray that twice a week only at the base of the plant. It kills the eggs, or if the eggs don't get killed by the soap, as soon as they hatch out, they take a bite, they get the BT, their stomach's paralyzed, they never get inside. BT, when I, huh? when I first, BT and soap together, okay. twice a week at the base, just the base, it's not that big a job, sure. right? When I first did this, I had to find a wholesale source for squash, because my solution before that was to grow successions of squash, right. and none of my successions died. I got complete control. Are you expecting these to come back? They could come back, we probably won't let them. We left them in for you to look right now and see what you see. You know? So, as far as you taking those little eggs off, is the, are they sometimes more yellow? That's a different one. That but, could, a, but it is a, still the, the beetle. It, no, no. What you just saw was squash bug eggs. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know the bug, the triangular one with the orange when you kind of hit the wings and it's a stink bug smell? That's what you saw there. But there's also the squash beetle, which we've seen at least one of. It lays eggs that look very much by lady, like ladybug eggs. They're yellow. The way you got a good hint that they're going to be the squash beetle eggs is they're on squash. Not that ladybugs couldn't lay their eggs on squash, but ladybugs, because they're predators, are always moving, chasing prey, so they've got a scattered egg patch. The beetle, because it can just sit and eat anywhere, lays a concentrated egg patch. So if it's a concentrated, nice, neat, neat little patch of yellow eggs, it's probably squash bug eggs. And is that true for bean beetles also? Bean beetles also. I don't kill either of them because they're food for the things that eat soft-bodied insects. You know, so they're not a problem. So you know, the vine borer is different than the, the beetle. In the totally different. It's the one that makes your plants just it wilt. Comes up from the soil, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's laid at the base. It looks like a, it looks kind of like a wasp, but it's a moth, okay. right? And it lays its egg at the base of the squash, yep. okay? And then it hatches nice. out and bores in, and you know that you have it because you see all this frass, right? Yep. And then there's a hole. Yep. If you get it very early, you can flick them out and kill them. Okay. Um, but the best thing to do is spray so you don't get them. You know, if you do that, I brought this up because when you spray that soap, the soap kills the first instars of the squash bug. You know, those little white ghosty things, they're not at all resistant to the soap. So you get control of most of your squash bugs as you control your vine borer. So you get, you know, one spray takes care of two pests and it works pretty well. Um, and I did promise you we'd talk about the things that are hard to control. So was it the borer that did this to the... No, no, this is all that the same beetle. aphid damage. Oh, it's the aphid. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the first the cucumber beetle and then the aphids. Uh -huh. The borer just attacks the uh, squash itself and that's it. No, that's the pickle worm. The, the borer attacks the stem and then the squash wilts. Yeah, right at the Yeah, right. okay, yeah. so maybe I... Your tomato yeah. plants are incredible. Aren't they incredible? That's called compost tea and biochar and all that it's stuff. Yeah. Real early, too. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fungus. It might be a fungus on... Let's just take that leaf off so I can get a closer look there. It might be a fungus that's feeding on aphids. Once again, it would take the, um, the loop. 
for some reason. I don't yeah, know. right. Well, that's what I mean, being taken out by a, by yeah. a fungus, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's not one of the diseased funguses to get on squash, you know. But it looks like a fungus to me. Yeah. That is a, a, bean, oh, a, a ladybug larva. Uh -huh. It might eat those. I don't know that they do eat those, though. Huh. You know, I've never, I haven't seen anything preying on those. Uh -huh. They're so pretty hard. Should I take know? them out with my finger then? Yeah, you could. Yeah, sure. Just brush them off or something. Yeah. Yeah. Other things we might have seen here would be a tiny little orange larva. That's a Phytolides. It feeds on, also feeds on all kinds of um, aphids and stuff. Keep looking as you walk out. Turn those leaves over and keep looking. See what you see. I'm just curious about the tomato for the compost tea. Do you foliar or start drench? We do foliar and drench. Yeah. Weekly? Weekly if, we can, if we're not behind. How much compost tea? I know you dilute it when you're going to spray it. We dilute it 50-50. Okay. Do you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Oh, absolutely, my friend. Pardon? Arachnid species that would be beneficial spiders? That All of them. So there. Is there a way That's to encourage good. them? Um, yeah, riot of diversity. Per yeah, preserving their habitat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, more, the more insects there are, the more they can feed, the more they're going to multiply, you know? Yeah, all the spiders are beneficial. Yeah, totally. Uh -huh. Now, I mean, I said all arachnids are beneficial. Of course, that includes things like ticks, and I'm not. Yeah. Someday I'll be convinced that there's a, there's a benefit to ticks, but at the moment I'm kind of clueless about that, you know? Like a mosquito. Um, the mosquito I know is food for fish, you know? I'm sure the ticks also have a benefit, but I have not paid enough attention. <laughs> that, it's, it is my narrowness, I'm sure. Do you know any other um, ways to balance uh, flea beetle populations? Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll go upstairs, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about because that's one of those tough Great. ones. So right here, yeah. folks. This is a tiny thing to see, but that's a lacewing larva. Oh, wow. In there? See how it's kind of transparent, has a line down its back? They can get much bigger, much, much bigger. Can you tell about that? No, right here, where my finger's oh, yeah, pointing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a lacewing larva. So it's got a line down its back. This yeah. is really got to see. See in the crevice? I have better pictures I can give you to put in. The, put I can in. find one and yeah. put it in there. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I knew we'd find it here if we looked. See it? Uh, yeah. Is that spin larvae? Now, you know, I should always look at it. For some reason, I like those corners a lot. They hang out in those corners, you know? It's not the first time I've seen it there. You know, I know what kind of spider's not beneficial, spider mold. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yes. But, you know, they're food for other things, you know? Yeah. Um, and one time I was warning um, the woman who was the head gardener at Gaia that she had thrips, uh -huh. and she didn't know about thrips. She looked it up, and they eat spider mites. Huh. So you never know. What's both a pest may also be a predator, uh -huh. you know? It's, it's just not that clear cut, you know? And spider mites are pretty easy to control uh -huh. if you know how to manage your environment. And then also they're great food for like the uh, minute pirate bug, Aureus insidiosus. Okay, let's go upstairs, see if we can get the slideshow going. And while it's being set up, we'll talk about the, the pests that I haven't admitted yet that are a problem, because there are some. And then you can all mention any that you have too.